Hi, good morning. My name is Chris Chumsey. I'm here with Jason Rouse. And it is our honor to introduce Kathy Costello, our first keynote speaker of the 2020 CAST meeting. Kathy is a William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor at Boston University with appointments in the departments of biochemistry, physiology, and biophysics, and chemistry. She earned her undergraduate degree at Emmanuel College and her PhD degree at Georgetown University and was a postdoctoral fellow and senior research scientist at MIT and worked alongside Klaus Beeman. She founded the Boston University School of Medicine Center for Biomedical Mass Spectrometry in 1994. Her research centers on development of mass spec-based methods for biopolymers and their applications to the studies of glycobiology, post-translational modifications, protein misfolding disorders, cardiovascular and infectious diseases, and bioactive lipids. She has authored nearly 400 research papers she was the president of the International Mass Spectrometry Foundation from 2014 to 2018, the president of ASMS from 2002 to 2004, and the president of the International Human Proteome Organization, or HUPO, in 2011 and 2012. She has received several major national and international awards in the fields of mass spectrometry, proteomics, and chemistry, and is a fellow in the American Chemical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our honor to present Kathy Costello. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks to you and Jason for the invitation to make a presentation at this meeting. And thanks to the tremendous staff who has put together the uh, presentations and the logistics uh, to allow this meeting to take place as a virtual operation. It's really impressive how well you've done it. And I hope that I don't do anything wrong to spoil your record. Uh, but I'm pleased to talk to you today about methods that are emerging in mass spectrometry and how they can be particularly adapted to analyze clinically relevant glycans. There's been a lot of progress in the way that we conduct medicine over the years. And the picture that's in the background here is just showing you a time when the comfort of the family and sympathy was about all that could be offered. Unfortunately, in these days, the comfort of the family is not so easily given to the sick person but we do have resources that we hope will help with the diagnosis and the treatment of those who have the unfortunate uh, situation of being ill. And we're going to look at how some of the kinds of methods that are being developed uh, could be useful uh, for these purposes. And I'm particularly talking about um, methods that have to do with the definition of glycans and glycoconjugates, which is an area which is often overlooked in um, the basic sciences. Uh, but the cell surface, for one, is covered uh, with glycans, and they are presented from things like small molecules that are glycosphingolipids, uh, but also to very extended uh, proteins which are anchored in the membrane. And then their interactions with the environment are often regulated by the presence on them of uh, diverse structures which are made up of glycans. And then proteins and uh, carbohydrates too are often linked uh, by a lipid connected to a glycan which holds them in place on the cell surface and which can be broken at the appropriate time in order for these molecules to be able to move about. So we want to understand what's the importance of these diverse structures that we see, how they change the interactions of these molecules and their turnover, and how we can define them in a way that we can understand their structure activity relationships and use this information to improve uh, the way we handle these biopolymers. Carbohydrates, 
for graphic purposes are represented by these small symbols that are shown down here on the corner in which both the color and the shape give us information about that particular glycan residue and they'll be used throughout this presentation. The kinds of interactions that the glycans uh, are involved in, first, many of them have structural and modulatory uh, roles, and these can involve both intrinsic recognition, in other words, self-self, and how these associate with one another, which may allow signaling, it may allow aggregation, may allow building larger structures, but then also it's the extrinsic recognitions of the self to other organisms, which may include invading organisms like microorganisms or toxics, uh, toxins, which take advantage of the structures which are on the cell surface in order to bind themselves and position themselves to enter, but also uh, to recognize which are the ones which they want to go to and which ones not. And often these will develop similar structures on themselves. And the reason for this will be to protect themselves against the body's immune system because if they clothe themselves in the host's clothing, then they can perhaps gain access and prevent being destroyed by the immune system. In other cases, the invading organism may not have the structure necessary to uh, construct these glycans and may hijack these activities from the host. And then even more so, they can build structures that are similar. So we need to know what's going on at each of these stages and which are the binding agents uh, which, to which the targets are uh, going to be attached. These structures are constructed as the protein passes just after translation. It's a co-translational process to begin the attachment of the glycans, an early hymenos structure. And these are then remodeled as the protein passes through, or the glycolipid also, uh, passes through the Golgi and the ER. And the remodeling takes place through a series of enzymes, which are types of transferases, which either can remove um, an initially present residue or put on a new one. And as these uh, carry out their activities, then we build up these kinds of complex structures that you saw in the previous slide. If some of these enzymes are overly active or in the opposite case missing, then it's not possible to construct the, the normal uh, types of glycans and aberrant ones uh, may be constructed. And so much of what we want to do is to understand and when necessary to control uh, the expression uh, of these enzymes or to compensate for them if one is missing and there's an alternative pathway to get the structures which are needed. This cartoon is showing you the construction of N-linked glycans, which are attached to an asparagine residue, but there are similar uh, types of processes going on in order to construct the O-linked, which are attached to serine or threonine distributions. And these can also be uh, disease dependent. And usually they're producing a series of related glycoforms, not just a single one. As I indicated, the glycosylation pathway is quite complex. And there are a number now of more than 170 of these pathways that have been shown to be involved with congenital disruptions, which leads to a large series of diseases, which are now referred to as congenital disorders of glycosylation. And these affect uh, many children and often shorten their lives or uh, disrupt uh, their ability to function well. So we need to understand these. In the case of infection or disease, the machinery is affected by other things which are taking place in the cell. In the case of cancer and other challenges, then uh, 
the production of cytokines, hypoxia, metabolic changes, can change the glycosylation substrates and affect the machinery that is producing these structures. And then here showing a number of cell surface receptors that are involved in signaling and transport. The little asterisks are marking where there are glycans present. And the presence of these may affect whether or not a ligand can bind. It can affect whether the, uh, for a receptor that needs multi-molecular attachments, uh, whether these are assembled properly in order to, for the binding to take place. And it also affects the interactions with the extracellular matrix. When these are properly in place, then signaling may occur across the membrane and more changes take place uh, further down these pathways. So these can affect proliferation, migration of the cells, which of course has to do with metastasis, survival of the organism or the tissue, and the permeability of the tissue. So the challenges that are presented from the analysis of glycans and glycoconjugates are that there is a lot of heterogeneity. There is the presence among these of stereoisomers and enomers and branching because although there are not many, as many different types of glycans present in say mammalian cells as there are amino acids, each one of them has multiple ways which it can attach to its adjacent ones. And in fact, it can attach to more than one. So the complexity of the structures that are present uh, can be much greater. There are then will be distributions of these glycoforms as I indicated. And since these particularly with the branching possibilities change the shape of the overall molecules and the shape of things which are covering the surface, and this affects these interactions that I mentioned at the beginning. The glycan composition within the various glycoforms may be changed, and it could be a very minor change, which gives a version which is much more active, but we have to identify that in the presence of the background structures. And then it's possible to have modifications on the individual monosaccharide residues, such as methylation, esterification, phosphorylation, sulfation. So we need to define these as well. Many of the linkages between the glycans, between the glycans and its a glycon, and between the modifications may be quite fragile. And so one must be careful during the isolation and also during the analysis to retain the original structures as long as possible until they're defined. And then the other part of the molecule to which the glycan is attached, the aglycon, may have a lot of variations in its structure as well, which can affect these interactions. And when it, on the cell surface, it can affect how much and when the glycan epitope is presented to the surrounding areas. And behind all these, there's the fact that unlike in the assembly of um, genes or proteins, there isn't a template behind them. So we don't have a definition of the only set of pathways that can be going on. How universal are the methods? How well are they performed from one place to another? Here's an example uh, that's just recently been published in Molecular and Cellular Proteomics, in which 75 different laboratories performed 103 different analyses to look at the NIST antibodies that are uh, available as standards for people to compare their analytical methods and other purposes. And here you can see the, in this axis, the number of different glycans that were reported by the various groups, the different methods which they used, uh, whether they analyzed the released glycan or at the glycopeptide stage, or fragments, or in fact, the intact uh, glycoproteins, and the type of laboratories which were involved. And what you can see here is there is a huge spread in the range of the number of glycans which are found by any, even within one method, but between the methods in the types of analytes that were chosen. And 
between the different types of laboratories that are carrying out the work. So one must take this into consideration and one must be looking to develop methods which can be carried out by many different types of laboratories with similar results so that one can uh, make comparisons and so that one can see that you're beginning to meet the standards which the FDA and other groups may impose. And as the methods get more sophisticated, of course, the rules get tighter. So I'm going to talk about some of the methods and I certainly can't cover them all in the time available nor all of the people who are contributing to this work. But I've just picked some as examples and I hope they will give you an idea of the level of activity in the field. So here's how some of the emerging methods can complement or improve the mass spectrometry analyses. And some of the ones I'm going to talk about have to do with methods that involve online separations, whether pre or post ionization, or uh, desorption methods that allow us to look at surfaces, dissociation methods, various ways when once we finally carefully produce the molecular ion, we can take it apart in a logical way so that we can get the information and reliable information about its detailed structure. Some of them are ones which are fairly well known or coming into more use and others are ones which have barely gotten out of the research laboratory. And then we can also consider more and more top-down fragmentation looking at the intact molecules. So first as to separations, and here's an example for LCMS methodology, where the glycoproteins are being captured from human serum by use of uh, antibodies specific for the various proteins of interest that are each in separate tubes. And the samples are, are passed through these and the effluent then when it's, uh, the part which is captured is then released, then we have a way of getting an enriched sample of selected glycoproteins for further study at quite high purity. Though of course one must realize if they have tight non-covalent bonding to other proteins, they may come out as well under such a purification. But this kind of thing can be automated. We can have tips packed with the different materials for the selective collection. And then we can release the uh, glycoproteins that have now been purified and release from them uh, their glycans and look at the glycan pattern specific for this captured glycoprotein. And in the example I'm showing you, it has to do with an ovarian cancer study where comparing the metastatic forms and the borderline forms. But all of these kinds of steps now uh, can be automated for reproducibility and high throughput. In this case, a more classic method is being used in which the different proteins have been captured now by the selective tips. And the, the um, retention time is observed from the chromatography and assignments are made against reference standards, but also to really verify and look carefully at these. Then there's a series of reactions taking place where specific enzymes that are called exoglycosidases that removes the glycan at the tip one by one are used sequentially. So we have a complex series of peaks in the beginning after one and then a second and then a third, fourth, fifth treatment with an exoglycosidase, you see that it's being reduced to smaller and smaller numbers of peaks. And we can define these more carefully and then see what was the original distribution of structures? Here on the IgG, but there's only one glycosylation site. It's of course defi defining that one site on a protein like IgM, which has multiple glycosylation sites. You see much more heterogeneity in what's going on, but again, a similar type of pattern is being observed. And then IgA, which has not quite as many sites as IgM, but still more than IgG, then we see this kind of pathway. So this is, can be a highly automated study and one can uh, follow this and follow reference patterns 
to be able to uh, study what the changes are in the patient at different stages of the disease. This relies, of course, on the fact that these have been defined in advance. And if one wants to, if one encounters peaks which are not readily assignable, then one has to go back to doing more complete structural analysis. But even the chromatography step and the interface of the chromatography to the mass spectrometer has some parts that have to be controlled. And often uh, graphitic carbon is used uh, for the separation of glycans. And is this, the effluent from that is entering the mass spectrometer because of the um, solvent flow that's being used here. Sometimes the very early eluding ones are not officially transferred and ionized. And this can then give an improper uh, idea of what the glycoform distribution is. So one can then insert after the uh, chromatography, a step in which there's additional solvent mixture put in that helps with the ionization of these ones which are disfavored. And in this case, we see an overall uh, increase of 30 to 100 fold, especially of the low molecular weight glycans. So it seems like a, an old technique and a very simple one, but even in the complex modern uh, LCMS systems, one needs to go back and look at these possibilities for improving uh, the reliability of the outcome. But we go back to using other types of chromatography as well as LC and the availability of Kepler electrophoresis interfaces uh, that are user friendly has increased in the last few years. And here's an example of the small chip uh, CE, which the 908 company has been making, which is a very small device that may be mounted on the front of a standard electrospray ionization mass spectrometer, takes a very small volume, and one can put the sample in one spot and then the buffers, and this then sprays off this corner directly into the ion source, and then the sample is um, analyzed by the mass spectrometer. In this case, we can look at a, an eight protein digest mix and see by HPLC separation that takes about 75 minutes what the outcome is. And in one minute of CEMS, we see that the coverage is quite similar to that achieved by the HPLC method, both in terms of seeing all of the proteins uh, which were in the mixture and also their percent of coverage in each of them. And of course, this reduction in time for the analysis is particularly important when one has a very large number of samples to analyze. Does it work as well for glycoproteins? Yes, here's a case of a triptych digest of human alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. And here are the peptides eluding first, and then after them, glycopeptides are eluding and here I've highlighted with these two boxes, uh, two glycopeptides where the same peptide is involved. And the only difference between them is an additional uh, sialic acid in the ones which are eluding in this position here. If we look at the MSMS spectra that were acquired at those two positions, we see, and this is HCD, uh, that we have enough fragmentation to define the uh, sequence of the peptide as being the same. And under these conditions, which are a bit harsh in terms of what happens to the glycan, we can see peptides uh, which have retained uh, part of the glycan structure and they look similar. And then we have some fragments which are the released glycan. And here we see the one which is key, which shows the one containing this extra sialic acid residue. Now enough fragmentation has occurred that we can't define uh, which of these sites is modified or if more than one is. Uh, other approaches to the glycan structure need to be done, but we can certainly very well uh, define these even on something that was done on that very fast time scale. 
but it works as well for very large molecules. Here's um, from a set of monoclonal antibodies now being treated, having been treated uh, by digestion by the IDES residue. And what we see here, so we now have, it's not the full antibody, but it's very large pieces that are left. And we can see is the FC chain and the FAB chain. And this is the electropherogram. Here now we're talking about a longer separation time. We're into the 40 to 50 minute time. If we look at the ion density, where now we still have time, we've just blown up this region here, but this is the M over Z signals that are being recorded. And we see that there's a number of different ones. These are various charge states of the same uh, species. And then we have the, the other chain and the egg glycosylated form of this chain. But if we spread this out and look at the uh, both uh, chromatography uh, and the mass spectrometry data information, we can see from this information that we can see post-translational modifications like deamidation. We can see slightly different uh, glycosylation patterns and we can uh, define all these very well um, and their modifications as they are alluding. And here are the couple of the mass spectra that were taken at the times corresponding uh, to the elution of the FC fragment, where we can see this a glycosylated form, but glycated and oxidized versions of it, and then all the different glycoforms here. And then for the FAB fragment, then we can see just the unmodified and with one and two sites of glycation. So this can be done with these large molecules also on the CE scale. But we mentioned that the structures and the, that are produced by glycans and the folding of the protein related to them really ends up with being a lot of different shapes in the final product. So now we can take advantage of the fact that these shapes are also an experimental fact and use them as a basis of a, a, se a separation. There, even for single glycans, there can be multiple conformations. So we can use this way as a basis for additional separation. And this is then ion mobility, in which case the sample is introduced after being ionized and passes through a region where there is a gas present and the molecules which have a smaller cross-section will interact fewer times with the gas as they pass through than those which have their sales spread and will interact many times and be slowed down. And so in this case, a very simple type of ion mobility separation, a drift tube, just a slight voltage change across here and a gas-filled region. And we see that what was a mixture in the beginning takes different times to get to the end. And so we have a, a separation which is based on the cross sections. And we can use this then uh, to separate a complex mixture and also to determine the physical property which is the cross section. This separation is on a millisecond scale, the drift time. The LC of course, the peaks there are on the scale of seconds for each peak. So we can take many of these separations for each LC peak. And then the time of flight mass analyzer is only using a hundred or a few more microseconds per spectrum. So we can take many uh, mass spectra as we go across each one of these uh, peaks that have been separated on the basis of mobility. So these three types of devices are very compatible with one another. In the case of glycans, what we can, the glycopeptides or glycans, we can then use um, this separation, but we want to build up uh, some kind of idea of how much does the separation, how much does the cross-section change as we change which residues are present and how many of them. So this is some data from an exercise in which 
We, again, and I've used this in several cases to keep it simple, human alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, which has five glycosylation sites, each of them with a different distribution of glycoforms. And we're just looking at one of the glycopeptides from that. Here's the sequence. And these, it has a fully sialylated form. So we can see what the cross-section of that is and then treat it with one of these exoglycosidases and remove these one by one and see how much this changes the observed collision cross-section. And also we can just look at the one that's the triantanary one and see under the same conditions how much this changes and use that as an additional point of reference in assigning the masses. We can go down then and look at the shorter ones, take off all the sialic acids, and then be able to take off the galactose residues one at a time. Now we see the appearance of both elongated and compact structures for a single form, but again, each one is separated. And then, we can see the different charge states. This also will affect uh, the position, but these are very reproducible and can be used both for the definition and for the separation. So by going through that sort of exercise, what we can see is that the free glycans, when we analyze them, and I didn't show these to you, they will fall across on one slope. The ones which are the glycopeptides, which were separated, uh, which were generated with either trypsin or uh, chymotrypsin fall along their own curve. And then the peptides which, from which the glycan has been totally removed have a different slope. So this is very useful additional information that can be used and can be built into uh, the search engines. The, we have a lot of choices though on how we perform uh, these kinds of experiments. And since the conformation of a glycan will change as we modify residues on it that may be acidic, or as we have metal binding to it, or if we look at it in the positive mode or the negative mode, then the observed conformations and the cross sections will be different. So, one can play with these variables until one gets conditions for the best possible separation for the system uh, being studied, but with the understanding that it is a function of all the conditions. And here are some synthetic mucins, which are um, have been prepared with the idea of putting these on an array to then look at their binding uh, in the case of Chagas disease. And so in the positive mode, we can see some separation among the members of this group greater than in the negative ion mode. But in the uh, second pair, which is shown in the positive ion mode, when attached to sodium, there's almost no separation. But, I don't, but the, uh, in the negative ion mode, they're cleanly separated. So it's a question of developing uh, the proper methodology, but realizing that the potential is there. Oops. Now different desorption modes we can use to get two dimensional information. And here's an example, of course there's quite a bit of work being done with tissue imaging, but I thought I'd include here this example of something which is a commonly used type of analysis where remote laboratories can submit their samples to one which is prepared to do the analysis often in the way of looking for uh, inherited disorders of glycosylation or other kinds of inherited uh, disorders, but here we're considering glycosylation. So the question was, can one see uh, this well from the dried blood spot that would be uh, the kind of sample that it's submitted and are these stable over time? So here we have uh, the MALDI uh, FTICR uh, separate uh, analysis of a dried blood spot. And this is from the laboratory of Manfred Wurr who has done quite a bit of work with the idea of uh, specifying the linkages 
of sialic acid even. First off, if one does MALDI ionization and to some extent uh, electrospray ionization under conditions where uh, there's high energy in the source, then it's easy to lose residues that are important like sialic acid or fucose. So one wants to have either very mild source conditions or to protect the group which is labile. And in his case, what he's developed is simple derivatization methods that will make different products for the two three linked versus the two six linked sialic acids that will stabilize them against loss and also give them a mass shift so that one can tell the difference between these. And on the basis of uh, using this technique, then using PNGSF, an enzyme which releases the glycan from uh, the protein backbone, then we can see all these different glycans uh, which are present and get the specific information about what types of linkages there were on the basis of the mass shift that was caused by this derivatization. So here sample prep and conditions are both important. And then they had a look at uh, whether the tissue source affected the distribution. And so we're comparing the plasma spot in the yellow uh, to a spot that comes from the finger uh, to a spot that comes from a vein. And you can see that there is some difference uh, depending on the source. And that one can then, all these letters are just indicating the different glycan compositions that are being found. And you see that the error bars are in fact quite tight for this type of analysis. And they also looked at these uh, by taking multiple samples and storing them for different times and then reanalyzing them, that the pattern is very stable. So this is suitable for being um, used for samples that can be mailed in. There's another uh, different approach, which is taking advantage of the properties of glycans and their interactions with proteins, which are called lectins, which specifically bind uh, different types of glycan structures. And what they've done here is to make uh, gold nanoparticles bound with a specific glycan. And then also to add um, a specific lectin and also to add to these same particles, a small molecule which is both easily cleaved and which has an absorption spectrum at a specific wavelength. And so you can see from its, after its cleavage, what the mass tag was. And you can also by microscopy, uh, look at the sample under the microscope. And then this is used for imaging cell and tissue glycan. So here we have a cell culture. Here we have a tissue section. And then by using, uh, letting these bind to what's on the surface, rinsing them on there, then they bind to specific glycan structures when one uses the laser beam, now one can do this kind of experiment as a MALDI experiment, but this is in fact using the laser to release these markers and then doing electrospray uh, on the products that come. And what you can see is you have peaks at specific masses and you also for the imaging experiment can see the difference uh, between the ones which had some of the glycan of interest and which didn't. And we can look at the next slide for a little more detail on that final figure. So we can compare the HE stain, just um, photography or imaging now with a specific one, this SNA lectin, which will show us when sialic acid is present versus this con A, which will tell us when there's a mannose residue presence. We see that in the cancerous tissue, this is a liver cancer sample versus the uh, early stage cancer development. There's not much difference and we have the exact mass and this result is also quantitative. That there isn't much difference in uh, just overall glycosylation because the con A is going to, that's the internal residue of any N-linked glycan, but here, with the sialic acid difference, we can see there's a huge difference uh, between 
the ones which are the highly cancerous ones versus the ones that are just at the early stage. So this is taking advantage of the knowledge of lectins and uh, specific simple chemistry and different types of imaging combined. Now, different kinds of dissociation modes uh, can also be used with various kinds of energy. And these are the ones uh, most frequently we knew used. And then we're going to talk about a new type. So the gentle conditions we can use with, even with low voltage, we'll see a little bit of glycan fragmentation. And then as we go up to higher uh, voltage for the um, collision energy or the HCD energy, then we'll get more fragmentation of the backbone that lets us get the peptide sequence. And how do we use that in a study? Here's a case of oligomannose glycopeptides which are being used um, to cause um, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And they're gonna target the high mannose patch, but what we want to do is see if we can mimic these kinds of structures and generate these antibody responses by making synthetic neoglycopeptides. And these are then made using click chemistry they look like high mannose structures, but they're at very specific sites. These are attached to short peptide, which is then bound to a large protein. And then these are um, injected into the animals. What happens is that the strongest response is not to the MAN9 structure, it turns out, but to the truncated structures. And so the question is, is this a real antibody response or is to the original one or is there an enzyme present in the periphery which is trimming back the glycan that was put on the drug and in fact taking it down to the smaller um, hymeno structures and this is the actual antigen in the end and can that happen to drugs that are used in circulation or to antibodies so we looked at these products after time in human serum. And here's the two glycopeptides that would be expected from the construct here. We think that they're eluding at these two places in the chromatogram. And we can see with low voltage, fragmentation removing the glycans. And so we see that there were very many glycans and the, the mannose residues are being lost one by one, but we have no information about the peptide sequence. At higher energy, we get enough fragmentation to define the peptide sequence. So now we know what we're looking at. We've made the source conditions extremely mild so that we don't generate any fragmentation of the mannose groups right with the ionization step. Sorry. Um, and uh, then over time, here's the 17 hours, we see that these smaller forms are being present and we can actually do pharmacokinetics of the glycoforms of the two possible high mannose peptides that were put in where the MAN9 disappears, MAN8 comes up and then seven and six and five. So we've seen that there are in the blood serum uh, mannosidases that are cleaving these back and we should um, be then careful to take this into consideration in the design of drugs, the vaccines that have these but we can see that it is possible even in complex mixture like serum to follow these pharmacokinetics. But if we want to do um, fragmentation that retains the glycan structure, we can then use HCD to find out where the oxonium ions are, the ones which are characteristic of a glycopeptide. And then when we see one of these to trigger a softer fragmentation, which is electron transfer dissociation. And so now we're going to look at conditions in which we keep the glycan present, but fragment the peptide backbone, and then just tick a little, tickle it a little bit with the HCD at the end to separate the non-covalent associations. Here's a case where we're looking at head and neck cancer at the EGFR receptor, and we want to see the glycosylation there and how it responds to a candidate drug. And we're thinking that it 
interferes with the wind signaling pathway and is blocking this stage. So blocking uh, the uh, forms which are going to be metastatic and driving it this way. Can we do that by following the glycosylation at the specific sites on the EGF receptor? Here with the uh, just HCD, we can define one of the glycopeptides and but we can't say for sure that all the glycan is at this site or that there might be some small O-linked modifications and not at all of it at this stage here. However, by looking at the comparison of an HCD of a different site, now all the blue ions are from the HCD, but then doing the H ETHCD experiment, we cause all the red marked fragmentation, but all those ions which would uh, contain the glycan are retained. And so we can say that it is located at this position and we can get the peptide sequence and also the information, the site specific information on the glycan, even with sialic acid on it. We can then look at the variation in sialic acid and fucosylation at different sites and see the difference before and after treatment of cells, which are both uh, metastatic and non-metastatic, what the response is, and see that it's very specific for certain sites, that there will be a change with them as opposed to the DMSO control, but not uh, to other sites. So if you looked at the overall protein, you wouldn't get good information. But if you look at the site-specific glycosylation, you can see in these key sites that there is a change. And the change with the fucosylation correlates in gene sequencing uh, with an increase in the enzyme, which is doing the transferase of the fucose. And so downregulation of this activity with the drug relieves the suppression that had been present of the uh, fucosyl transferases leads to the increased fucosylation and um, the change in how uh, metastatic the cells are. So we can follow all of this, but we have to be very careful for the conditions. If we go back to the ion mobility in a QTOF system, we can do this kind of experiment with that by putting here an opportunity to do ECD with a little cell which has magnets that contain electrons that are produced at a filament. And then as the sample passes through, they undergo electron capture dissociation and the fragments come out. It's quite small, fits in there. And we can see then an LCMS run from uh, fetuin triptych peptides and go and just look at this place right here and see that there are two different proteins, glycopeptides coming out and they're within three MOZ units where they're appearing. So if we just don't do any separation, then we'll see this spectrum, which is an overlay of these components. But if we use ion mobility to separate these components from one another, then for the upper one, we have this MSMS spectrum. And for the lower one, and these are just plus H and plus sodium of the same thing, then we have a different spectrum. And these clean ones, we can get sequence information much more easily. So here we get the ECD spectrum. And here, this large glycan with three sialic acids that weighs almost 3,000 is intact, and that we know that it's sitting at this site, and we can sequence the peptide. We can use this kind of uh, electron-based associations take it to even higher energy so that we fragment the glycans and using it in conjunction with ion mobility separation, now with an FTICR instrument, we see that for this mixture of human milk glycans, we have four peaks. But what we can tell by looking at these electronic excitation fragmentation that will give us a lot of fragments across each ring um, that peaks two and three have exactly the same spectrum and peaks one and four have different spectra. 
So these are two different confirmers. These are two different confirmers of uh, the same two peaks, but we can separate them very well here and then look at the individual EED spectra where that fragmentation is more energetic than the difference of the conformational change. So it stays the same. So there's no confusion and we can define them completely. And then another way of getting at it, these only tell us which monosaccharides are present, but we want to distinguish among the um, monosaccharides. A new way of doing that is instead of doing ECD or HCD, is to hit these samples trapped there with an infrared beam and scan that across a particular region, in this region, the OH stretch region, which in the gas phase has very specific bands. In the liquid phase, it's just a blob. In the gas phase, it's very specific for each monosaccharide. And not only that, but it's even specific for which linkage is present. So by adding uh, the infrared spectroscopy as an option during the LCMSMS experiment, uh, we can in fact get specific monosaccharide and linkage information. And then finally, I just wanna to mention top-down fragmentation as an example here. This is very complex, but I know you all get PDFs of these. So I thought I would include it to have you look at it. This is haptoglobin proteoforms. There are many different genetic variations of the sequence and this affects um, how it assembles and partly because it's hotly glycosylated. And this protein is important for removing uh, hemoglobin. And in the case of even the virus, which we have now where some people are, have different iron levels, it may be this interaction has something to do with it. So we can look at the intact complex with different numbers of haptoglobins assembled, separate them, and we have multiple charge states for each, but assign each of these. But within each of these, we have enough resolution to look at the uh, weights, weight-based assignment of what the glycosylation modifications are, and even which ones are more likely to form in each structure, in each um, glycoform. And then to get more specific information, we can go and do the release, separate these, and then do the release and do the entire uh, carbohydrate structural definition of each of these sites. And so come to a much better understanding of what's important and what's not uh, for this very important protein and how within different uh, groups of the genetic histories, uh, these things may be affected. So that's, and then there is a lot of help with this. There's a lot of cooperation in the carbohydrate community. There's a group called Mirage, which is helping to define uh, how glycan and glycoprotein, glycoconjugate uh, data are reported as guidelines. And then a lot of different databases that include reference spectra and methods from cooperation. And now the Unicarp, Uni, uh, PRO database is also incorporating carbohydrate information. So there's a lot to be learned, but there's a lot of help coming. And I encourage you to take advantage of these uh, resources that are becoming available. So finally, the kinds of progress we've seen is in mass spectrometry based characterization with the different separations, with uh, different types of dissociation, we have to look at the ion source and the mass analyzer conditions, and we can combine multiple techniques and develop new protocols. Some of the emerging possibilities are more CE and ion mobility separations that are getting more user-friendly and different types of dissociation that can be used on multiple types of mass spectrometers, and then going toward high throughput automation, advanced data handling, and then modeling, which I didn't have time to show you much of, that helps us understand what's going on. And all of these help us get additional information. I'd like to thank the people at, in our laboratory who contributed to the examples that I showed you here, uh, the collaborators who were involved in some of these projects uh, that I mentioned, and the companies that do a lot to cooperate as, 
we're trying to develop uh, new methodologies and understand what's going on and make changes in the instrumentation. NIH, uh, who supports us uh, very much in our laboratory, we did also have a grant uh, from Agilent. And finally, all of you and um, the organization for making it possible uh, to have this kind of meeting. And I'd be very happy to answer some questions in the remaining time. Thank you. Oops, I have to stop my... Great, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. You do hear me, right? Yes. Great. Um, and uh, thanks again for you know the interesting uh, talk this morning and also the comprehensive look at glycobiology and glycoanalysis. Um, so we do have you know five or so minutes for questions, and uh, you know you can type them in to the questions panel and hit submit, and I will read them on your behalf. Um, you know, Chris and I can start off uh, while you're typing. Um, so Kathy, one of the things you mentioned uh, early on was alter glycosylation. And I was kind of wondering on what, what you've seen in practice. Um, is it site occupancy? Is it different silation? Is it, you know, you talked about different modifications. Just curious. Yes, <laughs> I mean, all of these happen. Uh, the, um, and some of them are ones which are, are happening, you know, in the cell. And in some cases, if there's an error in the early stages of the glycan remodeling, then uh, the final product may not be formed. But what one can see is a difference uh, between the cell surface glycans and those if you digest uh, or just break up the entire cell because the ones which don't get their uh, proper full processing never make it up to the cell surface. And so even within a single cell, uh, you can see a difference there. But as the example I showed you with um, just the treatment of uh, this one drug candidate, that's changing the uh, fucosylation on uh, very specific sites on that protein and probably on some others. Um, in other cases, the difference between, well, what we can see is that it's driving the glycosylation pattern more toward the non-metastatic form from the metastatic form. In other cases, we've looked at things like the VEGF uh, receptor in which we can change the amount of signaling across that receptor by looking at, uh, that has very many, about 20 different N-link glycosyl potential sites. We found that they're all occupied and by knocking them out uh, one by one, find out which ones are the most important and then what detailed structure is important at those sites by then getting rid of such a thing as the silylation or fucosylation at that site and following it by looking at phosphorylation downstream, which is what it's signaling for. So we can see uh, changes uh, in specific proteins and specific sites on them as uh, a function of a glycosylation. And of course, for all of the people who have inherited disorders of glycosylation, then there's a specific structure that isn't being made. And in some cases, there will be another enzyme that can less efficiently perform that same action. And there have been cases where they then will overfeed the uh, glycan, which is being underpopulated and let the less active um, enzyme uh, take over the job of uh, making the proper glycoproteins. And in some cases that doesn't really completely cure the child, but it does relieve the symptoms. So one can see um, that even in uh, a disease where it's the native glycosylation, which is faulty, that there may be some corrective measures to that. Of course, gene replacement uh, would 
um, be very helpful and has been in some of these cases and particularly the glycolipid uh, storage disease and lysosomal storage diseases. Those are already um, used, they're very expensive treatments, but they do uh, allow the child to live and develop. Uh, Jason, are there any questions? I have one if there's nothing waiting. Uh, we do have two submitted questions. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll read them. So the first question is, how far away are we from the clinical utilization of glycoproteomics? Well, I think, um, of course, all of the antibody-based drugs are glycoproteins. So there's a lot of them already being used. And as I just mentioned, there's uh, some cases in which they're being used uh, to address uh, the underrepresentation of, of key enzymes. But we can understand in a much better way uh, how these pathways are not performing properly and then use very specific uh, types of drugs for the stage at which the fault occurs. And for that, we're in early stages of this, but this is why I want all you pharma people to get busy <laughs> and uh, keep helping us to uh, define uh, these pathways. And, and then you don't waste time giving somebody a drug which is not the error which is present in their form of the disease, but one which is more specific to their disease. So there's a huge amount of of possibilities there, and and even with the pre case of the the present virus, very many of the players that are involved there are glycoproteins, and in the case of uh, a virus, which as I mentioned, they often may not have a full apparatus to build their own glycans, but they will adapt those from the host, and so one has to look at the host. Um, patterns of glycosylation as well as the virus because they will be host specific, tissue specific, stage specific, but they do represent potential targets for interference with the infection process. Great, thanks Kathy. Um, so we have about a minute left. Uh, this should be probably a quick question. Uh, when performing native mass spectrometry, we often see in-source CID to around 130 EV. Do you see glycans being knocked off under those conditions of 130? Well, of course, that's very instrument specific, exactly the threshold, but it's, I would guess at that voltage, probably you're going to see some. The good thing is that when you're dealing with very large molecules, there are so many ways that they can get rid of their excess vibrational energy that in fact, the amount of fragmentation is not nearly as bad as it is with small molecules. And so you can uh, even use uh, CID uh, on intact uh, glycoprotein and have a small amount of it still um, survive when you, with the high structures with RNAs B, for instance, we've shown that it's still there, but it's much, if you use ECD or ETD, uh, then there's much less fragmentation. And when you go to the complex glycans, it's less, but it's uh, with the softer modes, but you do still see under those conditions, some survival of the intact species. And in some of those ones I showed you um, in that short example, there are some with sialic acid still on them because when you get up to 800 kilodaltons, there's lots of things, ways to get rid of excess energy. And so they have a chance, but if you take the component glycoproteins or the glycopeptides from them and subject them to that same energy, they'll be smashed. So, the tolerance is higher, the bigger the molecule, but they're still more sensitive uh, than things with tougher bonds. <laughs> yep. All right, well, we're gonna have to wrap it up, uh, go on to the next session. So thank you very much, Kathy, again, for uh, presenting today. And uh, again, if uh, maybe people can email you or something like sure. that if had further questions.
Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Kathy. Thank you.